In this video, from 2023, Mark Mason, author of the book series The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck, describes the three requirements of extraordinary success in life. Contrary to what everybody believes, it's not about getting up at 4 a.m., gratitude journaling, or even setting the right goals. Joining the 0.1% requires just three things. Number one, having a contrarian idea. Number two, being right about that contrarian idea, despite everybody telling you you're wrong. And number three, executing on that idea with prejudice, or what Mark Mason terms, putting your ass on the line, or what I term, going all in. The reason this formula is so powerful is its simplicity. It really nails the essence of what it takes to crush it. It's simple, but not easy. So let's break it down. The first part, having a contrarian idea. We all have ideas about how to make life, particularly our own, better, af more affordable, or easier. They say the best ideas come from scratching your own itch. These ideas often start with, there's got to be a way to, or why don't they make? Most of the time, the idea has already been executed. We just don't know about it. But once in a while, we stumble onto a product or service idea that just makes sense to us. We immediately dismiss it because it's just not normal like buying a book on the internet. You can't tell me that Jeff Bezos was the first person to think of that. Or replacing a horse in the front of a carriage with a motor. Or even creating a digital mail system called email. Dumb ideas, all of them. Or at least people thought so at the time. That's because those ideas are contrarian. Someone jumped out of the shower one day and said, what would happen if I tried to sell mattresses over the internet and delivered them in a box? When they pitched the idea to their family and friends, they were probably told that was a stupid idea and it's never going to work. But they persevered. For extraordinary success, a contrarian idea, by definition, disrupts an industry. And that's always going to ruffle some feathers and cause a lot of discomfort. For example, when the idea of email was introduced, most people thought it was a ridiculous idea and it would never catch on. Some people even fought the idea. After all, the US mail system was perfectly fine, but you can't stop disruption. And the second point, you need to be right about that idea. This is the most difficult step. The highway of success is littered with the wrecks of great ideas that people thought were going to change the world, and it turned out they were wrong. There's no amount of execution that can make a bad idea, well, good. For instance, in 2021, Facebook launched a video speed dating app called Spark. Yeah, I never heard of it either. But it shut it down less than a year later. Bad idea. Ever heard of the DeLorean motor car? Like Back to the Future car, the, the stainless steel coupe that was developed in the 1980s? That was contrarian for sure. It was well executed, but it turns out it was a bad idea and it didn't work at the time. The people whose contrarian ideas were correct had to endure countless attacks from the industry they were disrupting. Henry Ford, Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, J.K. Rowling, Walt Disney, and many other wildly successful people were ridiculed and rejected time after time. They were fired, attacked, and laughed at because of their contrarian ideas. But they were all right and eventually won big. And the third part, executing with prejudice. This is what everybody obsesses over. We see a successful person on YouTube and believe if we copy their morning routine, we're going to be successful too. You want a garage filled with Ferraris? All you need to do is sleep standing up, sit in a red light sauna, and drink coffee with butter in it. While execution is critical, it's not a substitute for the prior two steps. Great execution will never save a bad idea. To be wildly successful and join the 0.1%, you need to go all in on your correct contrarian idea and that is really hard. Everyone and their mother will be telling you it's a terrible idea and you shouldn't invest any of your time or any of your money in that ridiculous adventure. But you can't hit a home run if you're always trying to bunt. You have to swing for the fences. You have to go all in on the idea, provided it's right and contrarian. And once in a while, you're going to make sweet, sweet contact. You have to believe in your heart that the idea is right and have the patience and endurance to see it through. So why in the world am I telling you about this formula? This is a Bitcoin channel after all. Well, you're in the right place. I'm telling you about this formula because I believe Bitcoin fits this formula perfectly. 
I know Bitcoin is contrarian and I believe it's right. And the question is, how do you execute? Let's look at each point separately. Bitcoin is a contrarian idea for sure. Just ask Elizabeth Warren and other members of the global elite. They are scared to death. Do you think she'd be making such a stink over Bitcoin if it wasn't a threat to the system that made her a very wealthy woman? No, she'd ignore it like everybody else. But Bitcoin is as contrary as it gets to the traditional centralized fiat monetary system that's run by a select few people and big banks. They are scared of it because they can't control it, and by extension, you. Senator Warren is on the record saying that Bitcoin is only used by criminals for money laundering and tax evasion. Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan, agrees with her, and during recent congressional testimony, urged the government to shut it down. Recently, a U.S. Federal Reserve board member, Neil Kashkari, made fun of Bitcoin and said he never thought it would have any use as a currency. He also said, and I quote, If you live in any modern advanced economy, I would stick with the dollar, I would stick with the yen, and leave Bitcoin for, you know, the toy collectors. Keep in mind that this is the same person that all Americans should feel comfortable that the Federal Reserve has an unlimited supply of dollars to manage any fiscal problems that should arise. And Gary Gensler, the chairman of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, or SEC, issued a warning following his court-mandated approval of spot Bitcoin ETFs in January of 2024. That warning was, and I quote, Bitcoin is primarily a speculative volatile asset that's also used for illicit activity, including ransomware, money laundering, sanction evasion, and terrorist financing. While we approve the listing of trading of certain spot Bitcoin ETP shares today, we did not approve or endorse Bitcoin. So he's saying that he approved trading and purchase of the spot Bitcoin ETFs on the stock markets, but not the underlying asset that the ETFs hold. Mm, I don't see how that works. The European Central Bank, headed by Christine Lagarde, said in a recent blog post, I'm going to quote again, Bitcoin has failed on the promise to be a global decentralized digital currency and is still hardly used for legitimate transfers. Really? That would suggest that the half million Bitcoin transfers that occur each day are all for money laundering and tax evasion. Wow, I need to get with the program. The ECB's Jurek Binsel, Director of Marketing Information and Payments, and Jürgen Schaff, an advisor for market infrastructure and payments, continue, and I quote, the latest approval of an ETF doesn't change the fact that Bitcoin is not suitable as a means of payment or as an investment. Really? They went on in the blog post to caution investors that the recent Bitcoin rally, and I quote, could turn out to be just a flash in the pan, end quote. And quote, without any cash flow or other returns, the fair value of an asset is zero, end quote. Funny. Last I checked, diamonds and gold do not produce any cash flow. So the fair value of diamonds and gold is, according to his logic, zero. Are you seeing a pattern emerging from these bureaucrats? Bitcoin is evil and fiat will keep you safe and under our control. So Bitcoin is certainly contrary, but is it right? Well, the answer is a little nuanced, so stay with me. Bitcoin is freedom. Freedom from being controlled by the likes of Elizabeth Warren, Gary Gensler, Jamie Dimon, and Christine Lagarde, and all the big banks and institutions that collectively run the fiat money machine. And with the development of a central bank digital currency in the works, the amount of control the governments around the world will have over their citizens will rise exponentially. What and where you spend your money will be monitored and controlled for your own safety and protection, of course. They don't like how much you're spending on booze? Boom, your alcohol limit is cut in half next month. They don't like what you say on social media? Well, your accounts get drained or frozen. Attend a government protest? Your interest rates to borrow any money? just rose 3%. None of that can happen when you control your own sovereign money that no one can take from you. Bitcoin is also protection, protection from the fiat experiment. Throughout history, every single fiat currency has eventually failed and gone to zero due to mismanagement, debt, and greed. Bitcoin represents a digital life raft from the sinking ship of fiat. Governments around the world 
are printing money and borrowing at record levels, devaluing their currency beyond recovery. Unlike government-controlled fiat currencies, Bitcoin can never have more than 21 million coins in circulation. And with 19.6 million Bitcoins in circulation already, there are precious few left to be produced by the miners. That means almost 94% of all the Bitcoin that will ever exist are already in circulation. And the final 6% will take an amazing 116 years to produce due to the program reduction in supply every four years. This supply reduction helps keep the price elevated and the asset desirable. In fact, as of April 2024, Bitcoin will have an inflation rate less than half that of gold. In other words, twice as much gold will be dumped onto the market as Bitcoin. And in 2028, the Bitcoin supply will be cut in half again, etc., etc. In the U.S., the reckless money printing has dramatically reduced the value of the dollar over time. The more money that is printed and put into circulation, the lower the value of each dollar. This system represents a hidden tax on lower and middle class individuals, while the upper class gets richer by design. While the value of each dollar shrinks, those people that have accumulated significant assets, like real estate, stocks, or even fine art, benefit the most as the value of those assets skyrocket. Those people who are unable to accumulate significant assets get poorer and poorer as the purchasing power of their paycheck is eroded by the endless printing of money. In this graph, we can see how the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar has decreased over the last 225 years. If you'll notice, the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar was relatively level for 172 years until 1971, when it started rising exponentially. And what exactly happened in 1971? Well, the geniuses in Washington, D.C. decided it would be a fantastic idea to take the U.S. off the gold standard, which provided direct international conversion of the U.S. dollar to gold. At that point, the U.S. dollar was no longer backed by anything, and the money printers went into overdrive. And it hasn't stopped. In just the first 23 days of February 2024, yes, last month, the U.S. government borrowed $213 billion from the Federal Reserve, catching the attention of former IMF chief economist Oliver Blanchard, who said to the UK's House of Lords in a recent video conference, and I'm quoting, In the US, I'm very worried because the primary deficits are very large and there's absolutely no attempt to decrease them in any way, shape, or form. According to Mr. Blanchard, the record level of debt in the United States could be a catalyst for the next global financial crisis. He further states, and I quote, I don't see a big crisis coming, again, except for the U.S., where at some point it will happen. Whether it's in five years, ten years, I don't know. Even the current chairman of the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, admitted in a recent interview that he is concerned about the U.S. national debt growth and also that the U.S. is on an unsustainable fiscal path. Wow. Bitcoin is right. I believe it with all my heart. And everything I've read about the fiat system tends to agree with me. I've had every single accountant, financial advisor, and banker tell me I was crazy to invest in Bitcoin. They say it's not backed by anything. It's just air. It's nothing. But the more times I heard I was crazy, the more convinced I was I was right. Time will tell, but do you want to be on the wrong side of this fiat dilemma? Owning some Bitcoin could assure your financial future. The last step is executing with prejudice. Michael Saylor, former CEO and founder of the business intelligence firm MicroStrategy, has used a combination of free cash, loans, and stock offerings to purchase 193,000 Bitcoin at a price of 6.09 billion dollars since 2020. That investment is now approaching a value of 12 billion dollars and all but assures his company's entrance into the S&P 500 index. Most people thought he was crazy to make this type of commitment, especially when the price of Bitcoin dropped 77 percent from November of 2021 to November of 2022. So how can you execute with prejudice? While most of us can't execute at the level of Michael Saylor, I believe every person's goal should be to accumulate as much Bitcoin as possible and make it their goal 
to try to get to one whole Bitcoin. I believe that one Bitcoin could eventually be worth well over a million dollars and likely much higher. The growth of government debt and devaluation of the fiat currency will continue to push the value of the dollar into the ground and the value of Bitcoin up over time. Added to that, Bitcoin undergoes a 50% reduction in supply every four years, which we've discussed. Think about it this way. The upside is limitless and the downside is limited to what you invest. That is if it goes to zero. So how much do you need to invest to go all in? Well, of course, that's up to you. This is not financial advice. Believe it or not, a portfolio of 98% cash and 2% Bitcoin beats the S&P 500 in returns percent over any four-year period since Bitcoin was introduced in 2009. Yes, that's right. 98% cash, 2% Bitcoin. Crazy, huh? This asset can change your life, but it's not going to change anything if you invest $50. Eventually, that $50 may turn into $500. Enjoy your dinner. If you're going to execute with prejudice, you have to invest at a level that makes you uncomfortable. Not so much that you can't sleep, and not so much that you couldn't recover if it went to zero, but enough that it could make a difference in your life if you're right. I hear this all the time. Never invest more than you're willing to lose. I think that is complete bullshit. It's a statement designed to keep people poor. I'm not willing to lose anything, so should I just sit on the sidelines in all cash because I don't want to lose anything and I'm not willing to invest more than I'm willing to lose? That is not a good investment plan. And it's certainly not executing with prejudice. Why would anyone say that? I believe the opposite. Never invest less than would make a difference in your life. If you believe in Bitcoin and you want to get started, it's super easy. I would recommend Swan Bitcoin or Coinbase Exchange to start. I have links for videos on each of those in the description below. Open an account and set up daily, weekly, or monthly purchases and then just forget about it. Eventually, those purchases will add up and you'll be on your way to a whole Bitcoin. That is execution. So, how do you join the 0.1%? Well, first you need to subscribe to the channel and hit the like button and pay attention to my videos. I've been in this space since 2017. I don't know everything and I've made a lot of mistakes. But that's why you should listen to me because I've made a lot of mistakes and you can learn from them. I've done hundreds, if not thousands of hours of research on Bitcoin, and I'm here to help you learn more about this amazing financial innovation. Secondly, start today. Remember, there will never be more than 21 million Bitcoin, and there are estimates that 4 to 5 million of them are lost forever, so there's even less than that. This is the rarest asset ever created. So set a goal to get your stash up to one Bitcoin and start right now. Not financial advice. The best time to buy Bitcoin was 2011, and the second best time to buy Bitcoin is today. Good luck to you. Hope you join the 0.1%, and I will see you.